Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. We're pleased to welcome Daniel Hannan, member of the European Parliament representing Southeast England and Secretary General of the Alliance for European Conservatives and Reformists. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you. Daniel, we're coming up to the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, something every school kid learns about. I was fortunate enough on the plane on the way over to London to stumble literally on your book on my iPad, Inventing Freedom, How the English-Speaking Peoples Made the Modern World, which is, I guess you'd call it a book about Anglosphere exceptionalism. Take us back. Take us back to those Anglo-Saxons who emerged after the Roman Empire fell and tell us how they created the modern world. Well, the Magna Carta anniversary is a really good place to start. And it was where Jefferson started and where Franklin started. They traced the lineage of liberty back to this extraordinary event on this reedy riverbank in southern (laughs) England 800 years ago, where the most important political bargain in the history of the human species was struck. Now, look, I know politicians can be hugely prone to superlatives and to Mm -hmm. exaggerating things, but I think on this occasion, only the superlatives will do. You call it a bargain. Yes, because it was the first time anywhere on the planet that the idea that the government didn't get to make up the rules as it went along took written contractual form. So there had been vague promises in coronation oaths and things. There had been vague acknowledgments by kings that they couldn't defy Mm -hmm. God's law or whatever. But this was the first time that somebody wrote it down and said, you know what, you don't get to interpret this. There is going to be a conciliar form of government. There's going to be an enforcement mechanism. And it stands up. And just, you know, this is the the amazing thing, Bill. You just think now. What I'm saying sounds almost banal, right? 800 years on, we take it for granted. You know why we take it for granted? Because in English-speaking societies, it's become so ingrained into how we look at the world, of course. Well, because it works. Because it works. But how many other countries would love to have a system where the rules mattered more than the rulers, right? It it now takes a real wrench of the imagination, a real effort to think of how revolutionary it must have appeared 800 years ago to say, listen, the law is not the will of the biggest guy in the tribe. Mm. Above the biggest guy in the tribe is something that you can't see or touch or taste or hear, but it binds the king as surely as it binds the poorest guy in the kingdom, and that something is the law. And I think you called it the law of the land. Right. Well, the Magna Carta itself contains that phrase, the law of the land, which in our language is a commonplace. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we use it frequently. Without thinking about what it without means. Without thinking about what it means. And it's rare not in other languages. Not the law of God, not the law of the king. Right. It's not a holy book interpreted by mm-hmm. a prelate. It's not the will of the biggest guy. It is a law imminent in the territory and the population. It's the inheritance of all the people who live there. And what an amazing idea that is. Which is discovered, not contrived. Well, this was the biggest surprise to me writing the book, the extent to which the hero of the story turns out to be common law, which is, if you think about it, a very anomalous, Mm -hmm. I would say almost a miraculous system. It's not the code of Hammurabi, which we've had for a long time. Right. I'm not going to claim that the English-speaking peoples invented law. As you say, the code Mm -hmm. of Hammurabi was around a long time. There were Egyptian law codes, Sumerian law codes, you Mm -hmm. know, there was the the, the, the Roman law, and then, of course, Moses and Sinai. But this extraordinary beautiful notion that the law comes up from the people rather than down from the government. That instead of doing what every other legal system in the world does, which is to write down from first principles, Mm -hmm. from abstract principles, what the law should be, and then to apply those principles to specific disputes. Mm -hmm. Here is something where nobody has written it down, where it grows like a coral case by case with each judgment serving as the starting point for the next dispute. Honoring precedent. Right. And as a consequence, if you like, the legal system is domesticated. It belongs to everybody. It isn't an expression of the will of the state. It's open to the individual seeking Mm -hmm. redress. And there is an implicit respect for the notion of residual liberties. In other words, that if something is not expressly prohibited in law, the assumption is that it's allowed. Spend a little time on that. Nowadays, we call it permissionless innovation, but it really distinguishes the English-speaking peoples, if you will, the British and then American experiment from the Napoleonic Code, from the way the French and Europeans look at it, and certainly from the experiment of the European Union, which is trying to regulate everything. Of course it does. It it goes back to the Locke concept of an original compact, of a bargain. You know, we're all autonomous individuals who are ceding a certain amount of autonomy for the sake of having 
it's a effective society. Right. Now, that is a very, very different idea from the idea that the notion that uh, sovereignty flows from the state and, and the individuals are, are given their liberties. It was uh, the great uh, writer Aldous Huxley, who was in no sense a man of the right, who said, uh, liberties are not given, they're taken. It's actually really refreshing today to look at how freedom was conceptualized from Magna Carta and even before, right up until the American Revolution and the Declaration. It was an essentially negative concept, right? Mm -hmm. You have free speech, I can't shut you up. You have freedom of, of worship, I can't mm, tell negative you. Negative rights, not positive right. rights. Now, how is it used? Now, what do we mean by right? the right to work, the right not to be discriminated the right against, the right to affordable health care, the right to be forgotten as the EU is now. <laughs> now, these are, I'm not saying that these are bad things at mm -hmm. all, but they are not freedoms in the sense of being guarantees against coercion. They are rather entitlements or claims, which is a completely different concept. What made these Anglo-Saxon tribes different? Rome fell, this before the Norman invasion, and in fact, the first time I ever understood the Norman invasion was reading your book. What is it about those peoples that were special? Well, we have one very strong source on how Germanic societies organize their government, which is Tacitus, who was writing 2,000 years ago. And he explained that, unlike Romans, there was an extraordinary thing happening across the Rhine where the authority of a German king didn't come with the job, but was mm -hmm. dependent on the consent of the tribe, mm -hmm. and that there was a concept of the law being something outside the king. In other mm -hmm. words, what was eventually codified in Magna Carta, and of course is now the basis of all Anglosphere politics, was something that seems to have very, very old roots. The Saxon contribution. Right. Now, this was something that was taken for granted by most historians writing in English, and indeed in German, mm -hmm. up until the 20th century. So, Jefferson wrote frequently mm -hmm. about the Anglo-Saxon invention of this notion of, of, of personal freedom and, and common law. And this law. is a cultural concept, not a racialist concept. Sure, it's a cultural It's important one. because people bristle if they see it through racial eyes. Right, and it's important. Funnily enough, it became discredited in the first place because of the Nazi obsession with Tacitus, mm. which then, of course, made everyone else compensate back, by yeah. saying actually we want not. and and of course it was deeply unfashionable to claim to be german after the madness of the mm -hmm. 1930s so it slightly fell into into disrepute but actually no one has ever been able to disprove it and what we see if you look at the post roman kingdoms all over europe mm -hmm. is that initially there was a parliamentary tradition in almost all of the uh, the kingdoms of late mm -hmm. antiquity or the very early medieval kingdoms which gradually got snuffed out as the crown extended its authority, mm -hmm. because that's what happens. That's the normal pattern of human behavior, right? right? The people in power rig the rules so that mm -hmm. they have even more power and their kids have it after them. Mm -hmm. And the parliamentary and common law tradition survived only in isolated places. So you look at where are the oldest parliaments, you know what? They're all on islands. It was Iceland, the Faroe Islands, the Isle of Man, England. And the, the other place where it's an island. island. Well, in practical terms, mm -hmm. the early colonies might as well have been an island. Mm -hmm. it, you know, you think of the vastness of the American interior and the vastness of the Atlantic Ocean and these precarious population centers along the littoral. They had the mentality of an island people. In other words, they didn't abut any other country. Nor did they require a standing army. This was critical. And if you look at, you know, Washington's farewell address, which is still occasionally read out in the Senate, you look at <laughs> uh, Jefferson's two inaugural speeches, they were absolutely the speeches of somebody who led what he thought of as in practical terms an island, you know, mm -hmm. kindly separated by nature from the exterminating havoc of one quarter of the globe and, and so on. But just to, I don't want to lose your, your racial point, Bill, because this is mm -hmm. important. Neither of us in this conversation has an Anglo-Saxon surname. And the key point about Anglosphere freedom is it can take root anywhere because it is a cultural rather than a genetic inheritance. Mm -hmm. It is why Bermuda isn't Haiti. It's why Singapore isn't Indonesia. It's why Hong Kong isn't China. If you, if you get the structures right in a way that respects contract, property, personal freedom, and independent judiciary, and all the rest of it, everything it's follows. It's why the melting pot worked for so long in the United States. Right, and actually it was taken further in the US. The US is, if you like, the purest distillation of this notion. And we call it American exceptionalism, but your book pointed out it's not American exceptionalism, it's Anglosphere exceptionalism. It's Anglosphere exceptionalism that was brought to the boil mm -hmm. in the old courthouse in Philadelphia. The authors of the Declaration of Independence and of the Constitution, particularly of the, of the Declaration, were not 
motivated by a rejection of their identity as Englishmen, but quite on the contrary, by a, a, a massive reaffirmation of the rights mm-hmm. they always assumed they had been born with as mm-hmm. Englishmen, and which they saw a foreign monarchy trying to prejudice. They had the advantage, obviously, of being in a, a new world and a, a country without an episcopacy, without an aristocracy. They were able to go further. But they would have seen the reaffirmation of the principles of common law and Magna Carta and parliamentary supremacy, not as an abstract model that they were building mm-hmm. on a new continent, but as, as the logical culmination of streams of thought that are traced right back even before Magna Carta to the first Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And somehow these ideas survived invasion by the French, uh, takeover of all the key power positions by the, the Normans. How many years did that last before the original ideas reasserted themselves? Well, most people would say that the re- reassertion began with Magna Carta, so, you know, n- nearly 200 years. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, French remained the language of government and of court for more than 300 years after the conquest. And it's very easy if you look only at the topsoil to think that there was an extirpation of what had been a move towards constitutional monarchy. I mean, incredibly, Mm -hmm. in the the 10th century uh, and the early 11th century, we had effectively a kind of parliamentary government. We had precedent of of Witans, as they were called, telling kings Mm -hmm. the terms on which they were allowed to rule. That was, of course, all wiped out after the conquest, and it took a long time to reemerge. But it wasn't wiped out at the level of the subsoil. So although the court and the monarchy were centralized and the notions of Anglo-Saxon freedom were pretty much obliterated, they survived at county level Mm. and they survived above all through the institutions of common law and of the the courts, which were as much what we would now call local councils Mm -hmm. as they were courts. They, Mm -hmm. They had a governmental as well as a judicial function. The everyday business of government. Right. And because the number of people who'd come over with William the Conqueror was relatively small, they couldn't hope to staff Mm -hmm. the whole of the local administration. And that eventually reasserted itself, starting with Magna Carta. And I I mean, you could make the argument that between Magna Carta in 1215 and the Bill of Rights in 1689, you have a gradual reversal of the Norman Conquest. Mm -hmm. And and indeed, that is not a, a sort of romantic modern anachronistic interpretation. That was what a lot of the key players at the time said. They Mm -hmm. saw it explicitly in terms of what they called throwing off the Norman yoke. So, Daniel, one of the things you point out in your book is the vast difference between the English language and just about every other language on earth. Tell us about that. The obvious one is that there is no controlling authority. And when I say just about every, I I, Mm. I can't speak for the dialects that they have among Native Americans. But right. compared to the other big Western languages, sure. every other one has an Académie Française, a Real Académie Española, or some authority, authority that lays down the rules of orthography, spelling, and so on. English uniquely is, if you like, a libertarian language, rather like the common law. It, mm-hmm. It's exactly the same kind of exceptionalism. It, it grows up organically. Bar without words. Right. And as a result of this, it has many more words than any other Western language. It has nearly four times the vocabulary of Spanish. It has more than twice the vocabulary of French. It is a voracious, rapacious language. If we find a useful word, we borrow it without thinking about Mm -hmm. it. We don't have to ask anyone's permission. (laughs) And I love that. I I think that is very reflective of the character of the people who speak that language. It allows a wider range of thought. If you can't speak the word, you can't have the thought. Right. This was George Orwell's great theme in 1984 and in the appendices to 1984, that the more you remove words, the more you narrow the range of what can be expressed. And definitely English has an enormously wide range of words. There's even been a a study which I find fascinating that holding other factors constant, learning English as a foreign language Mm -hmm. in, you know, Middle East, say, makes you less likely to turn to extreme politics. Now, you know, how you do the methodology of that, I'm not a a, Mm -hmm. a linguist, but I could believe it because it has been the experience particularly of America. You think your mind. Right. You think of people coming from every continent and archipelago to the US. Whose great grandparents hated each other forever. And who may have come from places where there was zero tradition of personal autonomy, zero tradition of political or religious freedom. 
something was a key that allowed them all to become patriotic Americans. And a big part of that something was the language. Interesting. So sticking with this point for a minute, do you see the forces of political correctness slowly stamping out words for the purpose of thought control? I think you can see a reclassification of words. We were talking earlier about negative freedoms. Mm. Uncannily, actually, that was an example that Orwell gave writing in 1948. One of the examples he gave of a word that could be voided and traduced was the word free. He said free exists in newspeak only in the sense of this field is free from weeds, this dog mm -hmm. is free from lice. And so the concept of political or intellectual freedom disappears. Well, once we start talking about freedom from discrimination and freedom to work and so on, mm -hmm. we've lost the concept of freedom as not being bossed around, or at least we've prejudiced it. So yes, you do have this, uh, this reclassification of words. It's interesting in politics, for example, that greed only ever means somebody wanting to keep his own money. It never means wanting to be given somebody else's money. Hmm. You know, Need, on the other hand, always means wanting to be given someone else's money. And compassion means a politician who arranges the transfer. You know, there's a kind of a semantic shift sure. which is happening in a way that is not friendly to conservatives. One of the things your book opened my eyes to was the distinction between Whig and Tory across continents and through time. Tell us about that. The really tough thing when looking back at any historical event is to clear from your mind what happened next. It's so difficult to look at the American Revolution without a kind of present day map in your mm. mind of how it all worked out that Canada's there and it's a separate place and Britain's, a, you know. Of course, that wasn't how it seemed to the participants. Mm -hmm. For them, it was a civil war within an existing polity. A third neutral, a third loyal to the crown, and a third revolutionary. Well, so, so John remember. Adams claimed. Uh, that was that, those were his words. We were one third true, true blue and one third undecided. I don't know. Uh, but insofar as historians have been able to establish it, the sympathies of the population in Great Britain were very, very similar to those of the population in North America. Now, obviously, we, we don't have opinion mm -hmm. polls to go on. Mm -hmm. We have to estimate this on things like circulation of newspapers mm -hmm. and uh, people who signed petitions for coercion or conciliation or whatever. But what you're told now by the tour guides at Lexington, which is, you know, the British were here and the Americans yep. were here, yep. nobody would have recognized those terms at the time. Nobody. No, it, it, they were all British. Sure. You know, and... and, and Certainly before the French became involved in 1778, the idea that this was a war between two different political entities would have been Not unthinkable to whether you were patriot or, or loyalist. One of the things that I think has been particularly edited out of the American collective memory is the extent of popular sympathy for the patriot cause in the British Isles, mm -hmm. and especially in England. One of the, the reasons that events took on the momentum they did is that almost no one in England was prepared to volunteer to fight right. in a war which they regarded as unjust. The vast majority of people in England were sympathetic to the grievances of the colonists. Hence the Hessians. Exactly, hence the Hessians. Hence also, by the way, the fact that when Howe eventually took on the command, he was the fourth person to have been asked. The first three had turned it down, and he carried out his commission to the letter, but without enthusiasm. It he was, was an ugly deal few British commanders were prepared to engage in the kind of bloody counterinsurgency that would have Fire been necessary. Fire on their own people. Of course, of course. And so they were always looking towards what was eventually going to be a, a settled, negotiated uh, peace. And this, this has tended to be a quite understandably edited out of the American memory because all new countries reinterpret the immediate past. And they need their founding myth. Right, right. But, you know, it's a, it's a pity in a way because the story of taking a very old song of freedom and singing it in a louder and purer and cleaner form than it's ever been sung before is, a, to me, Empowering. a better one mm -hmm. than pretending that all of these principles were somehow invented without any precedent. The, for me, the classic thing that, that sums this up is the, the false memory of Paul Revere. You know, every American school child, or at least there was a day when every, words, when every American school child could, would say, oh, yes, he thundered through Massachusetts shouting the British are coming. Now, think about that story for 30 seconds yeah. and you will see the big flaw in it, right? It, it, that the entire population of Massachusetts was British. It would have been an extremely strange thing to yell the British are coming at a wholly British population even in Massachusetts, where they sometimes <laughs> vote in peculiar ways. Uh, and uh, what he actually was saying was the regulars are out, mm -hmm. uh, according to, to most of the sources. 
but in a way that that fake memory mm -hmm. is indicative of the whole ex post facto editing of the revolution because it, reconciliation took a while and we had our war of 1812 things got very strange during the napoleonic wars we had our reconciliation later and then came to the rescue of our mother country twice not once yes and even long before then, there had been a practical reconciliation. The Monroe Doctrine rested on the support of the British Navy, right. as, as all sides knew at the time, including Monroe. And it was perfectly clear to both British and American leaders, therefore, as early as the 1820s, that... That would be fine. We didn't want continental powers meddling in South America because we had more in common one with another than either of us had with France or Spain or any of the, mm -hmm. the, the, the other potential imperial powers. Actually, even in the Boer War, the US had tacitly supported Britain. Britain had more than tacitly supported America in, in 1898 in the, in the Spanish War. Mm -hmm. Both the Kaiser and Hitler made the calculation that if you were fighting the British, you were taking on the English-speaking peoples. Well, how else do you explain Hitler's otherwise bizarre decision to declare war on the United States in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor? And days later. It's because, in his view, the differences between the different Anglosphere nations, of which the inhabitants are so keenly aware, have never been that obvious to foreigners. They tend to lump us together much more. Mm. And they sometimes do it aggressively, as he was doing. They sometimes do it in a more sympathetic way. But where I work in the European Parliament, talking to French, Spanish, Romanian colleagues, whatever, they tend to see the English-speaking world, what the French always call the Anglo-Saxon world, as a homogenous block. And sometimes these things are clearer with the perspective of distance. Daniel, bring us forward from the failed French Revolution to the current European Union experiment. Where are we in that program? Well, it all goes back to the difference between the Anglosphere conception of a contract and the French revolutionary tradition of the general will of the people. Mm. Now, almost every week in the European Parliament, I will have the same argument with my colleagues. The topic varies, but the underlying argument is always the same. Faced with some patently unneeded and expensive directive, I will say, to what problem is this a solution? Right? Why do we need to mm -hmm. regulate What's broken? Pensions, you know, herbal remedies, whatever their thing is. And the answer is always the same. But the existing system is unregulated. And of course, in the Eurocrat's mind, unregulated and illegal are synonymous words. And the idea that a lack of regulation is the natural state of affairs, that we don't need it. Or preferred state of affairs, even. Indeed, preferred state. That is seen as the ultimate sort of Anglo-Saxon fetish. You know, oh, you British and you American, you, you'll never understand it. We need to have someone running it, otherwise it's chaos. Well, central planning only works if you have total control. <laughs> right, right. And uh, it ends up, as we saw in the Soviet Union, if you take it to its <laughs> logical conclusion. But you don't even need to, to look at that parallel. The European Union is now the only bit of the world that is experiencing continuing economic decline. I mean, six years on from mm -hmm. the banking crisis, every other region is recovering. North America, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, Australia, or European everywhere, growth everywhere. has stopped. European growth has stopped. We're coming close to a third recession in and the six years. Are fraying. And the reason is obvious. You know, we, we all know what's happening. It's overtax, overregulation, overstate control. And yet the argument in Brussels is, this shows that we need to get together even more so as to be able to hold our own in the world. Of course, you know, that's more of the, the medicine that sickened the patient. Yeah, it's not working. Let's do more of it. Which is always the argument of the bureaucrat, isn't it? As, as the great Upton Sinclair was fond of telling people, it is very difficult to make a man understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. <laughs> so forecast the end of the story of the European Union experiment. I think the European Union will last for a long time because there are vested Union. interests. No, I think some of the other member countries will keep this project alive because mm. so much depends on it. Rather like the apparatchiks in the Soviet Union, long after they've given up believing in the thing, they understand that their place in society depends on it. Mm. Uh, as Adam Smith said, there's a deal of ruin in a nation and there's a deal of ruin in the European Union. It can decay a long way before it collapses. But I don't think Britain will be part of it, at least not on anything like the existing terms. I think we will go for a much looser deal based on free trade rather than on political amalgamation. Mm -hmm. And I think that will allow us to ra raise our eyes to more distant horizons, to rediscover our global vocation, and in particular, 
to rediscover the importance of our commercial and military and political and diplomatic links with our English-speaking allies overseas, who, when the chips are down, have always been our best friends. Daniel, we're running out of time. I wish I could spend the whole day talking with you. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. That was Daniel Hannan, member of the European Parliament and Secretary General of the Alliance for European Conservatives and Reformists, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. Real Clear Radio Hour is produced in conjunction with Real Clear Politics, America's premier independent political website. Please stop by realclearradio.org to sign up for updates or access podcasts of our past programs. That wraps up our show for this week. Join us next week, same time, same station. See you then.